Listen to the heart now, and find another room. Facing a bone charm or room, and it beats faster as you get close. Whisper secrets. My favorite. Harry Potter and the Beating Heart of Secrets. There has to be a way to do that faster. Power section to exchange them for powers. How you use what I have given you falls upon you, as it has to the others before you. Now I return you to your world, but know that I will be watching with great interest. I like his jacket. The Hound Pitts pub. Hidden allies. Hidden in an old bar in the river, your new allies have plans to share with you. Meet with the Loyalist Center Circle to learn what they've got in mind. Quick pine blink. Actually, it may have. Nope, that. Okay, why is. Why did I do that? I can hit J. Why would I do that? Hmm. I feel as if that's something I would have done. Perhaps not.
Did you just say plant or just play plant? I enjoy the tanker. I mean, it takes like half an hour, but still enjoy it. I would never skip it. Yeah, I'm not seeing. Okay, T for that. Having a night plant. Plop is a good word. Bone chart. Bone charts. I want to say bone shard. Why do I want to say bone shard? Bone shards are a collectible in something. Bone charms provide small supernatural benefits. Locate them by listening for the song they emit. By def default, you can activate up to three bone shards at once in the bone charm section of the journal. Take that whale artifact. That's a thing. Never got that to. Never got it at a radio menu. Take care, Noodle. Journal of Granny Rags. Of course, I'll tell you, dearie. I won't keep any secrets from you in the end. All the dreary days of my life are like the windows of a house. From the kitchen I can see out to the garden where the leaves and stalks are brown and buck-eaten. You can see a little lump of dirt where something was wrapped in a blanket and laid to rest along the rows of twisting vines. The front room looks out, out into the street where the neighbors are all setting fire to their homes, barricading themselves inside, warm and snug, dearie. Don't forget about the bedroom, either. It sees into a dreary alley where... Hooligans are playing a game with an old man. The first two are hitting him with sticks and the girl with them is kicking at his dry old ribs. Oh, to have those boy or boins. Oh, to have those bones to boil them in a pot. Combined bones and boil. I do that a lot. That rhymed. Combining words, I meant. No one lives in my house anymore, dearie. No one you'd want to meet. When I lived there with my husband, we were fine, fine people. Vera Moray, everyone would say. Your house is as grand as a, as Bale Manor. Her boy, now that's Boyle. That doesn't know. I was right the first time. As Boyle Manor. Better even. Your dinners are lavish, and your parties are the best. It's Granny Trump. When that young Sokolov came to paint my portrait, I was nearly still in my prime. Radiant, he said, and he was just barely a man, so young, painting all the best people across the land. Everyone wanted a portrait by his hand, all my friends. I was the only one, dearie, wet with his paint, glistening on the canvas for a pretty coin. Evening, Kitty Chew. But it wasn't all parties and paintings. My husband and I weren't always home. No, we traveled together, he and I, to the far ends of the isles, beyond even, all the way to the red cliffs of Pendicia, to dig in the rock and crawl through the caves, holding up candles and squinting at the walls. 
Many precious things we came upon, but none so precious as the boy with the black eyes, dearie. All those marks and bones, carved so deep and polished so bright. I brought the, the old bones home, hid them from my dear husband. Then I learned to boil them and carve them myself. They made such good presents, dearie. The little mute boy took them home. He loved them so. All the time he came back with new bones for me, holding them up so I could see it in his eyes, even though his tongue was still. Granny, his eyes would say to me, carve these bones for me. Make me another present. And he went so far, so far, all the way to Dunwall Tower, the royal headsman himself now. My little mute boy and his shiny, shiny sword. Better bones were what I needed, you see. Better bones to carve and to polish, scrape and gleam. My dear old husband was always tired. I made him soup and then he was sick. Better bones was all. For my little mute boy carved in the name of the one with the black eyes. And after my husband was gone, giving away his birthday gifts, I didn't want to live there anymore. This woman is hardcore. So now I'm old and don't have many to give my presents to. It's sifting through the garbage for granny rags and feeding the little birdies that gather at my feet. No one wants to have tea, dearie, especially those rude louts on the battle or on Bottle Street. Slackjaw and his boy is always meddling with an old woman just trying to make her way. And the end will be together with him. You and me in the dreary night with stars above and below. And always the one with the black eyes, dear. Or, yeah, black eyes, dearie. That's this woman is a bit that tilting thing it does needs to stop. Why does it do that? That's really weird. I don't like it, but it's... Ruining my eyes. Still going to play RE7? Yes. I don't know what that means. Thought it said I could only... So many. Jesus Christ. Why is all of this... Is that DLC or something? Because that's... The comb, right? I remember that. Yeah, no, that's too much. Is absolutely going to happen. Well enough. Shadic Slicer. How about you? Field survey notes the Royal Spy. 
personal memoirs from Hiram Burroughs, dated several years earlier. This is the fourth day month of high cold. Progress continues on the su suppression of gang activity in the distillery district, but more slowly than I'd expected. The ruffians operating there have been cunning, I'll grant them that, but it's is only a matter of time. I'll see their leaders flagged in public and or flogged in public and sent beneath the royal executioner's blade. If I had my way, that mute bastard would be working night and day, removing the heads that need removing. Internally, the Empress does not seem pleased with my investigations. It seems that it is beyond her thinking, against her very nature as a trusting person, to believe that traitors move among us. But I know they do. They must. No, Jessamine would rather spend her time with the royal protector. At least he's likely to stop any immediate threat to her safety, but a strong arm is not what's needed against those who would undermine us. How will Corvo's sword stop a poisoned wine glass or an explosive delivered by courier? It will not. There are many threats around us, threats requiring meticulous efforts to police. Young lady Aunt Emily is undisciplined, I'm afraid. Here within Dunwall Tower she receives instruction from the Finest tutors known in the islands, yet her mother spoils her and spends most of her time. And she spends most of her time lost in imagination. She's a kid, of course. Wasting her time drawing, arresting Corvo to teach her to fight with wooden sticks. The girl might ru rule the Empire someday. Every moment spent at play is a moment wasted. Shoring up security for the main gate leading into Dunwall Tower has been another pet project of late. To think that back in the day of the em back in his day, Emperor Caldwin left it open to the public during the day, allowing anyone to come and go as they pleased. If it were up to me, I'd seal off access to the streets entirely, but the Empress won't hear of it. The water lock is much easier to protect, and if it were the only way in the tower, traffic in and out would be greatly reduced. Some day, the wrong person is going to slip in and will suffer for it. Mark my words. No amount of security security is excessive when it comes to protecting heads of state. The Empress also disapproves of my plan for the Sokolov devices. Sokolov himself has no interest in security, of course, but he's vain and therefore keen to see his inventions deployed in any fashion. This wall of light he's been tinkering with has promise. In any case, at least I was able to convince the Empress to upgrade the pistols carried by the officers Officers of the watch, my tongue. It's all over the place. Why do I worry so when no one else seems to care? If I ever fall asleep, will it all sink to the ocean? Will the rough things clamor over the walls and fill themselves on our flesh? That, no. This is what I see in the same dream several times each month. If I, or if only I had more sane things, more authority, I could protect us all. Hmm. This guy. Perhaps I've been working too hard. Dinner and an evening in co of conversation with a certain lady of refinement might be in order. Perhaps somewhere nice in the estate district. Aaron Burroughs, Royal Spymaster. Did he? Why did he sign... Personal memoirs. It's really weird. What would I like to see in the MGS series? Um, yeah, the only thing left to do, I think, would be filling in the gap between two and four. Everything else is fine as far as I'm concerned. Fair enough, strawberry cakeies. Have a good night. Oh, it won't end. It won't end. This is a really long one. Early life and criminal records, Slackjaw. You know the chinwag on Slackjaw? What was he like when he, when he was young, before he got his name? Always got a cool head now, but it weren't always like that in the days before he was 
boss of the Bottle Street Gang. Time was, young Slackjaw wasn't a reasonable man, or such a reasonable man. Like most of us, he grew up on the streets, running with a pack of ragamuffins and avoiding the law, pinching whatever he needed. Dark hair and dark eyed, smoking a pipe by the age of ten. For them born in the brothel, into the brothels or coming from the orphanages, it was either the gangs or working with the mud and larks, and no one wants that. Or the mud larks, and no one wants that. Some got pressed in the Navy or put down in the mines run by the Pendleton or Boyle families. As hard as it was on the streets, as hungry as we all got, at least we was free. By the time we weren't little, little ones anymore, Slackjaw was one to watch, usually calling the shots when we took down a farmer's cart or sidewalk street vendor. He'd come up with a plan, give everyone some part to play and decide on the split. Most of us just went along, because we learned fast that we made out better like that. More food, more coin. Plus, none of us wanted to deal with Slackjaw when he was in a rage. He worked on a couple of big jobs with Black Sally across town, and that was enough to get the attention of the other bosses. He wasn't just a street kid anymore. Now he was on the up and up, or now he was an up, an up and comer, which meant trouble. Another guy who fancied himself as such was Mike the Fish, who was working his way up, running the pro protection racket among the factory women. One fine evening, we were all taken in a body show at the theater house. Mike the Fish and his lot are there in the cheap seats, too, just down the aisle from us. Mike gets a wild idea. He wasn't big on planning and throws a heavy ceramic sp spittoon at Slackjaw. Gets him square in the face and breaks his jaw. We took to see if there's going to be a blood brawl, but Slackjaw just points at the door and we all leave with Mike laughing at our backs. Waking up the next day without telling us why, Slackjaw motions for us all to follow. Still can't say a word, so we just come along. We stop at the docks and Slackjaw buys, actually pays coin for it, a heavy chain covered in hooks. It's for fishing in the deep, something you get attached to a long line off the side of a ship. It's about four feet made of thick links, and there are sharks or shark hooks coming off it in different angles. Slack Charles got a thing got the thing wrapped around his left arm, dangling at his side. Not sure how he knew where Mike the fish was staying, but when we reached his girl's house, Slack Charles throws a bottle through the window just like that. It's almost noon. There's a bunch of screaming inside and Mike pokes his head out, looking wide eyed and baffled. When he sees Slackjaw in the street, a look comes over his face that still gives me the willies. Pure murder. I had to cough. And by muting it closed it, because apparently hitting one of my numpad closes it. Mike comes out the side door, bellowing like a blood ox, holding a cleaver, heading straight for Slackjaw. When they come together in their street, Slackjaw spins, and the shark hook bites deep into Mike's arm and shoulder. He screams, but Slackjaw holds on to the chain. He's standing there with his jaw broken, clenched tight, with the chain wrapped around his left arm, hooks sunk into Mike's, Mike the fish, just knifing him as fast as he can. Mike couldn't fight very well, hooked like that, and using his left hand, he, and using his left hand, but he was a big guy and it took a lot of stabbing before he went to his knees. Everyone was cheering at first, but then we all went quiet, just kept going and going until finally it was just Mike the fish blubbering, crying like a baby, and the sound of Slackjaw's knife. When it was over, and here's the brilliant part. Slackjaw took, a, took out a note and stuck it in Mike's face with a nail. He just said, if you want a job, come to Bottle Street. Slackjaw didn't talk right for a couple of months, but word spread fast. By the end of the year, once we had a sizable gang going, he sent out letters to other bosses, 
tell him that he was running a brand new crew over on Bottle Street. Most of them laughed or beat up the guys who delivered the letters. I have to cough again. I need water, is what I need. Most of them laughed or beat up the guys who deliver the letters. Green-eyed Trish even came back missing a thumb, but apparently Slackjaw was expecting that kind of reaction and had a backup plan. A week later, four of the bosses were dead. It seemed like a series of unfortunate events, but everyone knew better. One shot dead by the watch while standing in the middle of a meat market, another slipping and falling into the water out cold. One of the older bosses found in bed with his belly opened wide and a tivy and spare, tivy and pear stuffed into his mouth. Still not sure what that meant. And Sheila Barnesworth was found bubbling in a cauldron hot wax. Are you making me sick? To my stomach. Slackjaw sent out another set of letters. Offers to... Offers to the underbosses. Telling them they'd be treated fair as peers. Even sent green-eyed Trish with one of the letters. All the underbosses accepted. God, it just keeps going. After spilling the guts of his main competition, Slackjaw went in for stabilizing his business, real neat-like. Calling in favor, smoothing things over, giving everyone a little bit of coin or drink as a bonus. Showing what we could be like as a as boss. So everything got quiet, which always makes the boys at the city watch nervous, of course. Warren went out among the Royal Spymaster Snitches, the responsible citizens group, they call themselves. Telling everyone working in a shop or sweeping off the front steps of their homes to keep watchful eyes for Slackjaw and his men, trying to suss out what they were up to and what had just happened. But Slackjaw ain't stupid. He greased a few palms among the shopkeepers and the watch too, telling them that he was in town and to stay that, or that he was in town to stay and that things would be run properly from now on, without so much blood. He was finally a real boss, ready to settle in the business of moving whiskey rounding the hound fights and offering up the ladies and gentlemen of the night, if you take my meaning. Then the plague came. This reminds me of Peaky Blinders. At first it seemed like a good thing. A few people got sick and everyone wanted to buy those potions from Sokolov or Piero. Health elixir, spiritual, spiritual remedy, they call them. Slackjaw told me he saw an opportunity. We already had an old whiskey factory with a still, where we could water the stuff down and sell it discounted. Doing the same with Sokolov's elixir was a smart plan. Pretty soon everybody in the slums was sick and business was good, but after a while there were so many people down with the plague that everyone got scared. Everybody started acting real nasty and everything fell apart. When people can't work, they don't have the coin for elixir. Water down or pure. When the Empress died, it seemed like Dunwall would slide into the void. Spymaster Burroughs took over and the watch started using all that new Sokolov technology. Watchtowers, toll boys and their and them arc pylons. Oh, the shock things, right? They put up a wall of light. I remember that. I, it's all coming back. A wall of light across Clovering Boulevard and cracked down hard. But Slackjaw surprised us again. Instead of leaving town on a boat bound for Morley or one of the other isles, he stayed and kept it all together. We get as much elixir to fight off the plague as the city would.